Welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, the show designed to help make middle age your prime time of life by defying the notion that once you reach 40, 50, or even 60 years old, your crowning achievements are all behind you. Regardless of whether you're just approaching 40 or are firmly entrenched in your middle years, it's time to launch your very own personal journey toward a joyful and purpose-filled second half of life. Each week, host Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, will discuss the challenges common to middle age and help guide you to a brighter tomorrow. Now, here's Roy. Well, welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. I'm your host, Roy Richards. You know, when... uh, Welcome to Fall and our series of programs on relationships. You may recall we talked about relationships way back in April and May as one of the six R's of midlife renewal. And to refresh your memory, the other five R's we talked about were resolutions, New Year's resolutions specifically. But, you know, you can make resolutions at any time. And by resolutions, we mean a genuine commitment to change things for the better in your life with a solid follow-up action plan, not just these silly New Year's resolutions so many of us make and break within the first week of the new year. The second R was retirement planning, and we're talking not just about finances, but planning your entire lifestyle and your activities beyond the year when you got off the payroll. And remember, you're not retiring from life just because you're no longer earning a living. These are the years that should be the most fulfilling and the uh, the most active, uh, but on your terms, strictly, and as long as you feel up to it, do it. The third R is recharging your small business or career midstream, and you don't have to suffer just to earn a living and put bread on the table. It is possible to get someone to pay you to have a good time, but first you must take control and decide just what you want out of your life and your career before you can do that. The fourth R is re-energizing your body, mind, and spirit through a proper diet, exercise, and a healthy living regimen. And you may recall we talked to one gentleman who was like 70 years old and had the physical body of someone in their 20s. And that's uh, not for most of us, obviously, aren't going to do that well, but all of us can uh, feel better and live longer with a proper diet and exercise regimen. And our fifth R was recovery from any one of uh, life's inevitable midlife traumas, and we're all going to have them, unfortunately, at one time or another. Death of a loved one, job loss, divorce, injury, a serious injury, or an extended illness of a loved one, or maybe of ourselves, that we have to recover from. And really, there's only two choices following one of those uh, traumatic events. Either you uh, shake it off and go forward with a positive outlook on life, or you uh, spend the rest of your life miserable, and that's really not much of a choice, is it? Well, over the next several programs, we will concentrate on relationships in greater detail, And we'll talk about those with your spouse or romantic life partner, your boss, customers, and co-workers on the job, your children and grandchildren, friends and neighbors, or just others you encounter uh, casually in daily life. The person that, uh, you know, you have a choice either to be uh, friendly or rude to when you meet a person on the street or to uh, pretend to ignore, but they're there anyway. And uh, really adds to your life if you make some casual friends along the way. You know, you and I both know that other people make life worth living, and the only individual I can think of, really, that uh, was totally satisfied, at least for a while, all alone, was was somebody that I saw years ago, and I don't recall whether it was an Alfred Hitchcock or Twilight Zone. It was one of these half-an-hour black-and-white shows. And this uh, was kind of a timid individual. He was sort of a little man that uh, was the only survivor of a worldwide plague, and somehow he'd been immune to that. And he was walking around New York City. He was the only one alive. Uh, But he was very happy because he was sly and hated people, but he loved books. And in a joyous mood, he headed for the New York City Library to read every book in the stacks, and he knew that he wouldn't have to earn a living anymore and that no one would bother him, and he could read to his heart's content. But this poor fellow had a real Coke uh, Coke bottle thick like glasses, and on the st- 
steps up to the library. He tripped on a step, and his glasses fell off and smashed into little bitty pieces. And he sat there forlorn because he could no longer see well enough to read the books. So even the, it proved that even this hermit needed other people. On the downside, of course, other people directly or indirectly create most all of the sorrow, anger, distress, and heartache in our lives, even if we don't have direct contact with those we want to have contact with, and we're lonely, and it's the lack of people that make us lonely. So we really need, uh, as a necessary evil, to have other people in our lives. And if you're a regular listener, I trust by now you've launched your positive renewal journey to a joyful and productive second half of life, and you're beginning to wake up each morning ready and eager to face the challenges of the day ahead. You have a long-term game plan in mind, both for yourself and for those you love, but what if your spouse and children, your close friends and neighbors, your boss and co-workers on the job remain completely bogged down in the negative, or at least some of them do. How do you uh, avoid or deal with others who continually attempt to infect you with a bad news virus? Let's say, for example, that it's Monday morning after a so-so weekend. You didn't have a great time, but it was okay. You get up in the morning and your spouse is in a bad mood and complains about his or her job that he or she doesn't want to go to. She says that uh, you're not doing your fair share around the house and didn't get the closets cleaned out like you'd promised over the weekend. Your teenage uh, son only grunts when you say good morning and then refuses to reveal anything about the status of his homework or his plans for today and this week. Your fellow morning commuters on the bus are surly and rude, and several complain loudly that the bus was 10 minutes late. Then when the bus arrives, they push ahead to be the first ones on the bus and get the best seat. Your boss confronts you when you enter the office and is not at all happy to learn that a major project she assigned only last Thursday is not complete, and uh, she puts all kinds of pressure on you to get it done first thing today. At lunch, a few of your co-workers spread rumors of a pending reorganization that will be very bad both for you and them, that puts you, uh, attempts to put you in a very bad mood. Then they gossip about a co-worker who screwed up on a major project and may get fired, and furthermore, she is about to get divorced. On the bus home, a rude gentleman gives you a dirty look when you ask him to please remove his briefcase from the seat next to him so that you can sit down. He doesn't uh, make you feel like he really wants you sitting next to him, does he? And a woman in the row in front of you is in the midst of a loud, obnoxious argument with someone on her cell phone. At least uh, the one good thing is you can't hear the other end of the conversation and the argument from the phone. And you walk in the door at home and your spouse is in a very bad mood after she had a very bad or he had a very bad day at the office. In other words, your day has pretty much been a zero. And over the next several uh, programs, I will be interviewing relationship experts who can help us to remain positive and interdirected around all these grouches. You know, you can't always influence the events around you, but you and you alone can control your reaction to them, and that's what we'll be talking about. As a first step, let me suggest that you continually keep in mind that no matter what, your goal is to project a positive image that's consistent with the firmly grounded, newly positive inner you. Don't let anyone shake that inner confidence that you have found. First of all, you can refuse to gossip, complain, or speak harshly for another, either behind that person's back or, for that matter, to his or her face. You can pay attention to another's complaint if it involves you, and you can respond forthrightly, but refuse to let anyone draw you into a petty argument. There's so many of those around. You can accept criticism where it's merited without resentment, and you can bow to try to address others' concerns and you may need some help in doing so, and don't be afraid to ask, but always be open to suggestions and ask for help to get whatever the problem is resolved. If in the past you've been a fellow complainer, don't expect opinions of you to change overnight because it takes time and effort, consistent effort, to build a new positive image, 
and prove yourself worthy of respect through uniformly positive attitude and behavior, not hollow promises. There's nothing worse than constantly promising your spouse that you will change, that you will treat him or her better, or you will start helping out around the house, and then you don't do that. That's very self-defeating, as we all know. And don't just inform others that you've changed. Show them. That's the key there. You have to, your actions have to back up your words. Assume the initiative in seeking to repair a rocky relationship. Maybe you've had a neighbor you've never gotten along with. Uh, See if you can't uh, strike up a conversation someday and make that uh, relationship a little better. Or someone maybe you've had some disputes with at work. Take the initiative to see if you can't uh, solve some problems with them. And treat the next stranger you meet on the street, on the bus, in the supermarket, wherever it might be, as a friend. It's not as hard as as you think. And, you know, I can speak from personal experience. I go out for walks, so three or four times a week. And some days when I'm in a bad mood, I just sort of stare off in the distance and pretend that somebody walking my way doesn't exist. And that really creates kind of a negative cloud for both that person and for me, but on other days I warmly smile and ask how they're doing and uh, maybe crack a a light remark or a joke, and the person just lightens up, and you can tell that it has made his or her day as much as it has mine, and it's so much easier to do that than to turn away. And at the end of the day, take quiet time out and reflect upon all the positive and negatives in the relationships you had over the past 24 hours and be certain that you understand why each negative interaction took place and also a new positive interaction for that matter and uh, what the new positive you, the image you're trying to convey to others, what that positive you would have said or done rather than what the real you, that person you're trying to uh, overcome, did or said. You know, along with a positive attitude goes positive energy as the old cable guy would say, to get her done. You know, a worthy ultimate objective for all all of us at middle age is to become what we call an energy supplier as opposed to an energy drainer. You know, a few years ago, a major company CEO made this distinction, which I talk about in my book. To quote from my book, energy drainers are warriors who have more shadows than sunshine, You talk to these people and you feel drained at the end of the conversation. By contrast, energy suppliers don't have all the answers, but they say, leave it to me, I'll find a way. You feel good around them and you want more of them. Just for a moment, peer with me six months into your future. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in six months, for that matter, if in one week or today, if those who knew you best described you with three sentences, a person of complete integrity who always keeps his or her word, a caring individual who never fails to demonstrate a warm, loving concern for everyone that he or she meets, and a positive, self-confident individual who approaches every human action, interaction as a win-win proposition. Now, I know your name and my name is not Jesus Christ, and he's probably the only one who's ever lived up completely to those three uh, descriptions, but we can certainly try and come closer to it. And I I will talk in much greater detail about uh, the relationships in my book on renewal, A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up. And to preview that book, I'd highly recommend that you do so because you don't have to pay anything to preview it go to our website or to amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com and it's available both as an ebook or as a print in print version and our website is www.middleagerenewal.com and in our website on our website you can obtain a free gift uh, watch my 10 videos which are also free, and read some of my blogs. And I've been blogging for a long time now, and I've got a lot of recognition from them. Now, fasten your seatbelts, and we'll plunge headfirst into midlife relationships. And today's subject is marriage.
Well, like so many couples of uh, middle age, do you and your spouse face a host of problems and disagreement in your marriage today? Are you constantly arguing over finances, raising the kids, division of labor on household chores? Maybe the bloom is off the rose. One or both of you no longer feels the passion that you shared when you first met years ago or when you held hands and hearts together on your honeymoon. Maybe you seldom, if ever, interact as genuine full-life partners and you have no real plans together for the future. And other than arguments, you seldom communicate. You shudder when the spouse says, we need to talk because you know something bad is coming. And maybe one or both of you have strayed off the reservation and have had an affair in recent years. Well, here's the shock. Today's guest says that focusing on marital problems or frustrations is the absolute wrong way to solve them. And our guest is Elliot Connie. He's a renowned psychotherapist and marriage and family counselor. He's worked with thousands of couples and families in his private practice. He also trains clinicians worldwide on his solution-focused approach to marriage counseling. And he's a founder and owner of Solution Focus Training Institute and author of three books. The latest just released, The Solution Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. And hello, Elliot, and welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. Thank you very much. Hello. Well, if you don't mind, let me role play a little bit. And uh, <laughs> my, Let's say that my wife, Ellen, that's not really my wife, and if she's listening, I'm not really talking. I'm just role playing here. But let's say we've been married for 32 years. And we're approaching empty nest. Our youngest child is a freshman in college this year. We both work outside the house, but neither of us particularly enamored in our jobs. No infidelity, but our marriage still is in trouble. I, I say my wife is always nagging me and constantly complaining about my behavior and telling me what to do. And my wife says I try to dominate her and frequently exhibit a chauvinistic attitude toward men. And we routinely argue about finances and just about everything else. Uh, my wife wants to uh, fix up and redecorate the house. And me, I'd like to take better vacations and um, buy season tickets to the Cowboys, plus put money away for retirement. And we have frequent o arguments over housework because Ellen says I put all the burden on her and I don't agree. I mow the lawn after all and I trim the shrubs and I do minor repairs on the car and around the house. And we have few uh, common interests, and we just don't talk about retirement or what we're going to do and how we want to spend our retirement together. And uh, I reluctantly agreed to marriage counseling to save our marriage, because, and a mutual friend recommended you. And as we enter your office, both of us are ready to unload all our complaints, hurts, and problems on each other. As a counselor, what would uh, you what would be your suggestion suggestions in order to flip the conversation from negative to positive and uh, and to begin to search for solutions? Uh, that is a great question, and from a counselor's perspective, it starts from the very first utterance of the counseling session. So you're totally right. In fact, I had a couple that almost mirrors the description you you suggested just last night, mm -hmm. um, but. <clears throat> It starts from my very first utterance. Couples come into the office completely prepared to unload their data about the problem and give me what they think should be done to solve the problem. But yeah, the they each probably part, have a different what <laughs> each one thinks differently too. I'm that's sure. exactly right. They each have a have a different strategy on how to solve sometimes even different problems. Yeah. But my very first utterance is what are your best hopes from this work together? And that helps orientate people from what's gone wrong to what they'd like to have be different in their relationship. Yeah, and if you don't have a map to where you want to go, you're not going to get there very well, that's, I wouldn't say. That's exactly right. So the very first thing we do is identify a map. Most people come prepared to show me the map that has led to the current problem. Yeah. But my very first utterance orientates the relationship towards a map towards someplace different. Yeah, and when you're going on a trip and you get halfway there, you, you certainly don't look back on the, the method that got you to the, where you are today. You look back, you look That's forward totally. to how you're going to achieve the uh, solution in the future. That's totally true. I mean, if you most people are not happy with their current situation, and a lot of times, understandably so. 
But if you got in a taxi cab and a cab driver said, where would you like to go, it wouldn't make any sense at all for you to say, not here, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> you, have to, you have to tell the cab driver where you'd like to go. Any place but here. <laughs> exactly. And as a, as a counselor, I'm not going to accept an answer such as any place but here. I need to know exactly where you'd like your life to go. Yeah, that's very true. Well, what's the difference uh, simply between solution-focused brief therapy and traditional forms of psychotherapy? Well, the difference is a solution-focused brief therapist is much more likely to engage in an activity that we call solution building. And that is, it's a, it's a process of identifying what a client, or in this case couple, wants to have different in their life and yeah. assessing what strengths, skills, and traits they have amongst them that can make those those hopes, those best hopes of potential reality, and what steps are either already happening and going unnoticed or need to start happening to make those best hopes reality. Oh, yeah, that's that's uh, where the uh, reality meets the road when you actually yeah. come up with the solutions to the problem, not just identify it. But uh, That's exactly right. And a problem-focused therapist is typically going to engage in what we call problem-solving activities. So yeah. they're going to assess for the problem, try to identify the origins of the problem, and then brainstorm strategies to remove the problem. And the difference is that approach, I mean, it works. I mean, we, we all know that psychotherapy works, but yeah. it's painful and longer. And um, in, in working with couples, I think it, it, it allows for the potential opportunity for really bad, hurtful arguments to take place when a couple really came to the office to have a productive conversation. Yeah. Well, what's the, the so the uh, the basic, most fundamental idea for a successful relationship? You is you basically are saying is to have goals that both of you can agree upon and uh, and work toward those goals rather than uh, discuss problems and what's wrong with the, your partner in the marriage. Yes, yes, I think I think every couple should have goals or every couple should have dreams, and that's part of what makes most couples launch in the very beginning of the relationship is, you know, we have these very idealistic conversations that are in essence goal forming, like, yeah. you know, where would you like to live and what does your dream house look like? And, you know, if you meet in high school, what kind of job do you want? Like that's all orientating ourselves towards the future and we need to continue that activity. Yeah. It's, it's strange how some, at some point in life, getting into middle age, probably uh, we start focusing on the dream future as a couple and uh, you know all the things we're going to do and have and uh, enjoy, and we start looking at what's wrong with our life, and uh, you know the kind of hollow feeling that there's nothing much ahead to look forward to. Right. And that's uh, that's kind of I guess the reverse of what your uh, therapy uh, therapeutic uh, approach is. Yes, sir. I think there's always something to look forward to, and we have to work really hard to keep tomorrow on our mind. Keep tomorrow in today's language. Yeah, we're always trying to fight the uh, the conclusion that so many people re sadly realize, believe at middle age that uh, the best is behind them and that, uh, you know, there's really nothing to do other than uh, head to their retirement village and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. sit in front of the, <laughs> on the porch rocking in a rocking chair or something. <laughs> no, yes, no, I am absolutely not one that believes that. And I, the other point that I noticed in your book uh, that made it is that we humans always tend to remember and regret what we did wrong and forget what we did right so that we don't uh, really take the positive uh, credit for all the things that are right in our lives rather than concentrate on what's wrong. Yeah, I, I think that's true. We We have a tendency to accept, you know, blame for our flaws, but we don't have the equal tendency to accept credit for our successes. Yeah, isn't that strange? We, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think we need to work to, to remedy that. I, I think if I'm willing to accept blame for my flaws, then I have to be willing to accept credit for my successes. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, uh, in your book, you talk about five tips to turn marriage problems into solutions, and I yes. know we don't have time to go into great detail, but maybe you could uh, summarize each of those five steps, and uh, because that basically is uh, the essence of what your book is all about, and uh, 
it give people a little feel for what uh, some of these things they need to be doing? Sure, sure. Well, the first of the five is, as we just discussed, having a goal for your relationship. Yeah. <clears throat> and I don't mean sitting down and having a business conversation and developing a contract or, you know, anything crazy <laughs> like that. But, you know, you have to make sure that the car is heading towards some sort of unified direction that both people are agreeable to and yeah. both people are willing to participate in. And the only way to do that is to keep having conversation about where we're taking our lives. Yeah. The second one is taking credit for the honeymoon phase of your relationship. And basically, like every relationship comes from a successful path. Yeah. If we didn't have a successful path, we wouldn't be a relationship. We wouldn't have chosen to be together. So we have to understand that that didn't happen because Cupid shot you in the heart. It happened because you did some skillful things to encourage your partner to fall head over heels in love with you and choose to spend the rest of your life together. And your partner did some skillful things to cause you to fall in love with them and choose to spend the rest of your life with them. So we have to take credit for whatever those skills and traits. Yeah, uh, I, I, I loved in your uh, book how you you encourage couples to uh, reminisce about the when they first met and early in the relationship and uh, and and like you said, it's not just something they fell into; it's something they worked at, and uh, you yeah. know, especially honored another person and wanted to uh, hear what that person had to say and wanted to, uh, you know, we're always on your best behavior when you're around <laughs> that person, and uh, you really together worked at building this relationship, and uh, there's no reason that you can't continue to make it better going forward. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Uh, the, the next thing is to have continued conversations about progress. So yeah. now that we know where we're taking the relationship and we are more aware of the skills and traits that we have that contribute to the relationship success, then we have to notice each other applying those skills to the relationship using progressive language. Yeah, and it, it's very useful if you can compliment your spouse when he or she does something that uh, is improving the relationship or growing the relationship, credit is due and uh, you should recognize the other person. And, uh, that's, that's exactly right. And again, we typically do this during the happiest times of our relationship. We have a tendency to do this on purpose. But when relationships yeah. are stressful, we don't necessarily do it. Like, for example, when we start off a relationship, we will frequently compliment our partner like, like, wow, I'm really having fun. You're so much different than my ex. This is great. But two years into the relationship, we don't talk like that anymore, and, and I, I encourage people to continue to do that. Yeah, and we did, at least we could uh, compliment them on their dress or on, on something positive about them. That's, uh, sincere, yeah. I don't mean to make fake compliments, but uh, no. there's always yeah. something that a person that you're living with that, uh, you know, they're doing better than they did last year or last week and uh, are pleasing you and uh, – you want to know, obviously, if you do something that's pleasing your spouse, that they should tell you that. And it's a... Right. In order for a compliment to be impactful, it only has to be, have three things. Uh, it, has, it has to have three components. Number one, it has to be true. Yeah, number two, it has true. to be positive. And number three, it has to be meaningful to the, rece- the receiving party. <laughs> yeah. if, you can, you, if you can do that on a daily basis for your partner, your relationship would be transformed almost. Yeah, I, I don't think a, a good positive comment will, well, you don't look quite as fat today as you did yesterday. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> but, so you'd be surprised. And people <laughs> people sometimes compliment based upon their reality. Like, for example, if I love cars yeah. and my best friend doesn't like cars and I see his car looking shiny and spiffy and I say, hey, man, I love your car. I might think I gave him a meaningful compliment, but I didn't because it's yeah. not in his reality. So yeah, we have to be true, positive, and meaningful to the receiver. Well, what's what's the fourth step then? And I really like this one. But uh, yeah, well, every marriage counselor on earth basically is going to tell you that the most important thing that you can do in your relationship is to continue to date. Yeah. When I say that, I mean it a little bit differently. Like I don't mean just the activity of dating. I mean the mindset of dating. Yeah. When you're putting your best foot forward and you're noticing your partner putting their best foot forward and really working to make the other one, your other partner, become happy and observe the very best of yourself. So the, yeah. the fourth is to continue to date as a mindset. 
I like the uh, idea of little surprises or doing something special for your spouse right. just out of the clear blue, not necessarily waiting till uh, Valentine's Day or, or your anniversary yeah. or something. But uh, And it doesn't yeah. have to be a big thing either. I saw a couple last night. They've been married for 30 years, huh. and uh, their their children are all in Well, their their youngest is in high school, hmm. and their, child, their two oldest are in college. And... Um, they were talking to me about how in the beginning of their relationship they would, like, surprise each other at work and leave yeah. notes and uh, leave little cards on the windshield of each other's cars yeah. and things huh. like that. And when I asked them when was the last time they had done that, they said over 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> that's the sad part. <laughs> exactly. So we have to continue to win each other over. In your book, I like the story about David and Sue, this a couple that had already gotten divorced, been divorced for a while, and uh, then they went to counseling and ended up getting remarried again. <laughs> exactly. And, it, you know, that stuff happens more often than not because, you know, we never really fall out in love. One of the, one of the greatest lies we tell ourselves is, I don't love my partner anymore. Yeah. We never truly fall out of love. What we're really saying is my partner is no longer doing the things that trigger loving feelings. Yeah, no longer, unfortunately, it's often my partner is no longer doing things to please me rather than seeking things you need to be doing to please your partner. Exactly, and when we get back to doing that, then those those loving feelings really stay present and and, uh, can transform a relationship so quickly. Yeah, like in my book, I I talk about how, uh, you know, if I were, it's like, Two tanks in a in the old experiment we used to do in high school, where they'd pour water in one tank and it would always uh, settle to a common level, and it's just not going to work if you're with your partner and your partner does everything to please you. But uh, she t- say if it's a woman pleasing a man, she says, "Well, you watch football whenever you want, and uh, we'll spend the weekend in front of the TV set, and I'll bring you beer whenever you want." And uh, you can just do whatever you want. <laughs> That's not going to be very pleasing to her. Maybe she's a football fan, but I still don't think that, uh, you know, all that one-way type thing is going to work. No, she's not going to enjoy that at all, I can assure you. No, that's for sure. And you're not either because, uh, obviously, at some point in time, your mental states settle to a common level. It uh, can't work if it's, you know, one partner is – doing everything to please the other partner and there's no reciprocity or anything on that. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And, you know, as humans, we tend to do what's comfortable and not what works. Yeah. The real basis of having a solution-focused marriage is sticking to what works and making yeah. that comfortable. Well, what's the, the last... fifth, what's the fifth step? Because that kind of fits right into what we're talking about. It, uh, you know, you yeah. have to... The, the fifth step is to function as a partnership. So yeah. each person has to have their role in the relationship and and uh, contribute their skills and traits so that they really kind of fit together like a puzzle piece instead of uh, fighting against each other. Like a really good example is there are a lot of coupleships where one partner might be good with money and the other one is not. Well, the person good with money should be using that skill for the betterment of the relationship yeah. instead of the opposite. Yeah, and um, it's so foolish when each couple or each uh, person tries to do their own thing, even if they're not good at it or insists on doing something they're not good at, just Absolutely. because that's uh, traditionally, the, <laughs> you know, maybe the man's much better with the, uh, raising the children and, and some aspects of it than the, than the spouse, and just because he's a man thinks that that's a woman's job, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. If you, whatever the skills are that you possess, whatever the abilities you have, you have to use them. There, there's a couple I'm currently working with where the man owns his own business, oh. and they have a newborn triplet. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> there's a new challenge. <laughs> exactly. And the wife is a high-powered uh, like marketing executive. So because the man owns his own business, he has a much more flexible schedule. Yeah. So he's able to put that skill to the betterment of the relationship. So he's actually taken over most of the care for these triplet infant uh, infant children. Well, now, he's got a new full time job there. <laughs> that's right. And all of his all of his family is saying that he's doing a lot of woman's work. 
but they're not really noticing that he's not doing women's work. He's doing what his skill set allows him to do. And, you know, it's, and it's so great that he has enough uh, self-esteem and confidence that he doesn't worry about people. Oh, you're doing woman's work. I mean, it's a, it's it's really a sign of strength that uh, that you recognize what you're good at and that you do that and that you don't worry about what some other person says you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> that's exactly right. And here in Texas, that's a that's one of the heck of a feat. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Well, how best can listeners obtain your book, The Solution for Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship? Um, You can get them at all major booksellers. You know, it's on Amazon. You can get the paperback version on Amazon. You can get the Kindle, uh, Barnes & Noble. You can can purchase them on the Nook. Uh, Really, any place major books are sold, you'll be able to find uh, this book. Yeah, and you know... uh, Elliot was nice enough to send me a copy, and it's it's just a short book. You can read uh, in lick, lickety-split time. It's about like 92 pages long, but it, it gets right to the point, and it's, uh, yeah. if you do the exercises, they're not easy. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> for instance, in Chapter 1, you, uh, you as a couple sit down together and come up with no less than 50 details of your relationship as you want it to become, and uh, you prepare these details together, and uh, <laughs> there's no shirking, but uh, <laughs> and you say no less than 50, so you no can't settle for 49. <laughs> no, no, no less than 50. But uh, that, I think these exercises are especially great for middle-aged couples who have long since moved away from the honeymoon phase and, uh, you know, want to get back into it and... Uh, it, it's so important that you realize that this person that uh, maybe you've been married to 30 years, 40 years, is the same person you fell in love with back in the honeymoon stage. And I think going back and uh, realizing exactly what attracted you to the person, uh, what attracted you to each other in the first place, and um, realizing that you're still the same people uh, deep down that you were back then obviously you've changed in a number of ways but uh, it's still the same person you loved and cherished in the beginning and uh, there's no reason you shouldn't love and cherish them now that's exactly right and uh, you have a very interesting website that uh, offers some blogs and also uh, if you're a a professional therapist or something you've got a number of uh, audios and videos that uh, can help in the training what's what's that website yeah, thank you. That website is uh, ElliotSpeaks.com, www.elliott speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S.com. And you're right, I, I blog on that website. I've got a lot of products, and my speaking schedule is on is on that website. And also, if people wanted to buy that book, if you bought a book from there, I would be shipping it to you directly, and I'd be happy to uh, sign it for people. Oh, that sounds great. And I know you... Uh... You conduct seminars and uh, training sessions and stuff all around the world. In fact, I think you're headed to Europe within the next week or so, aren't you? Yeah, on Thursday afternoon, I'm heading over to uh, Denmark, Sweden, and then uh, Copenhagen. Uh, no, no, Switzerland, Denmark, and then Sweden. Boy, those are beautiful places to go. I envy you, actually. That, uh, <laughs> you get around a lot. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that uh, any couple would... Uh, who is having any kind of problems or even if the, the relationship just kind of grown cold and uh, old hat, this would, uh, I would highly recommend that you get a hold of Elliot's book uh, and uh, the solution focused marriage. And I love that solution focused approach where you don't keep concentrating on the problems, but you concentrate on uh, where you want to be. And that's so similar to what our theme here on this program is you wake up to life and you wake up to uh, a future that you want uh, for yourself rather than concentrating on everything that's wrong today. Absolutely. And well, best, of luck, awesome. best of luck to you and in, uh, in the sale of your book and in your seminars, and have a great trip over to <laughs> <laughs> Thank Denmark. you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Elliot. Okay. You've been listening to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, hosted by Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of both A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, and Wake Up, Captain and Crew, Restart Your Engines. You can learn more about Roy and his Middle Age Renewal training system by visiting his website, middleagerenewal.com.